Okay, welcome everybody to the Blockchain Commons hosted Gordian Wallet Developer Meeting uh, for December. I, this is the last one of the year. Um, if you've not been here before, what is Blockchain Commons? We're a community interested in self-sovereign control of digital assets. We bring together stakeholders to collaboratively develop interoperable infrastructure, we are a neutral not-for-profit that enables people to control their own digital destiny. In particular, uh, this year, we've been working together on Gordian Envelope, uh, which enables sovereign and collaborative recovery. Uh, we have a number of sponsors um, uh, this year that have helped us uh, be able to accomplish what we have uh, been able to do. We encourage you to join and become a sponsor yourself. So last month we had a discussion about output descriptors and some of the challenges of making it work um, in the Seabor ecosystem and some discoveries as we uh, have evolved them. Um, which also led to some discussions about the envelope CL CLI, and we had some initial discussions on the CSR re reporting and a uh, uh, little bit about some of the recent articles we published at uh, Rebooting, I mean, excuse me, at uh, Blockchain Commons. Uh, today, our agenda is uh, to uh, talk a bit more about uh, the Blockchain Commons repo, more on output descriptors, including a specific proposal, which we'd like your feedback on. Uh, we have a brief demo of the Gordian Depository. Um, and if there is time, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, open development and for remembrance. So the repo overview. Uh, Shannon, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Actually, that's something that uh, I had planned on talking about because okay, I, have a, I have something I want to share. Take over. So, yeah. So I'm Wolf McNally. I'm the lead researcher for Blockchain Commons. And um, I'm, you know, even though uh, Shannon is one of the primary maintainers of, of the of the uh, of our repos and makes sure that they are all um, uh, and make sure that they are all uh, uh up to snuff in terms of our quality standards and making sure the documentation there is all there and all that. Um, I'm the one who actually commits most of the code <laughs> to it. And uh, I wanted to provide a brief overview of uh, how our repositories on GitHub are constituted. And uh, because I think that'd be valuable for the community to under kind of understand, especially because there's been talk about, you know, um, how many dependencies there are and things like that. And of course, I think it's impossible to build anything without dependencies. Um, and uh, and what we try to do is create a very kind of logically structured um, uh, hierarchy of of uh, uh, software tools, uh, some of which are uh, libraries, some of which are our end user applications like Gordian Seed Tool for iOS, and some of which are command line tools. So I wanted to give a brief overview of that. Uh, the tool I'm using to show you this is Flying Logic, um, which is a tool I actually wrote too as well. Um, but uh, I wanted to start by pointing out that we're primarily working in three languages right now, C, C++, Swift, and Rust. And as you can see from this high-level overview, um, our Swift uh, libraries have some dependencies on our C++ libraries, but our Rust are pretty much all pure Rust. They pretty much stand alone. Some of the, uh, all of these have certain third-party dependencies, which you'll see alluded to as well. So let's, let's start by looking at the, uh, at the uh, C++ or the C and C++ libraries real quick. Um, uh, these are all usable by themselves if you want to use any project itself. But uh, you know they include things like our, our crypto base, which is some very low-level cryptographic algorithms that pretty much everything else uses. Um, our uh, Shamir Secret Sharing Library, which actually uh, is used by our SSKR, which is used for uh, uh, for backup of keys and uh, uh, self-sovereign and social backup recovery. Um, our LifeHash algorithm, which is used for to create visual hashes of various kinds of things like keys and seeds and, and so on. Um, and then uh, some things are uh, shims on top of other things like like LibWally. Um, we have a, a library which shims on top of that, which we use for various things like Swift and so on. Um, we also have several high level um, uh, CLI tools. One's called Key Tool for der der deriving keys, Seed Tool for generating and deriving seeds. And ByteWords, which is essentially a, a, a tool to wrap and unwrap um, uh, sequences of binary in our ByteWords format, which is part also of the UR format. Um, so as you can see, there's a, there's the UR for, format library. Um, so 
Um, now let's go to the uh, the Swift. And these libraries uh, start with, again, uh, Swift shims on some of these things, CryptoBase, SSKR, and so on. Um, and uh, and then DCBOR is our implementation of, of uh, Gordian deterministic CBOR. And then these basically are, are used by a lot of the higher level things. Um, these are third-party dependencies. We won't get into those right now. But uh, as you can see, you know, it builds up through things uh, like um, uh, our cryptographic algorithms all shimmed properly for Swift that sometimes depend on third-party libraries. Um, uh, secure components, which is where we start introducing things uh, like uh, uh, seeds and keys and so on. Uh, envelope uh, on top of that. Um, and then Swift Foundation, where we introduce a lot of uh, various kinds of various Bitcoin specific things like output descriptors, which we'll be discussing. We also have tools, uh, libraries for reading and writing NFC cards. We have our life hash, which uh, is uh, built on top of the, the C implementation. Um, and then uh, 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 our UR kit here, which is a standalone implementation of, of UR, including the fountain codes for breaking up, which we'll also be discussing. Um, and then uh, UR UI, which is uh, iOS um, uh, affordances uh, for, for, for example, the anime and QR codes and so on. Um, and then, you know, various kinds of ways of bundling these into things like uh, our um, uh, our Gordian C tool, which is kind of our flagship iOS app. Uh, and a new version of that was released today on the uh, for our beta program, uh, a new version of uh, beta 1.6 that actually includes the new output descriptors uh, that we'll be discussing the version three output descriptors. Uh, so uh, some of these are demo apps. For example, there's a demo app to demonstrate uh, fountain codes with URs. Uh, couple of demo apps to start to show off, you know, life hashes, things like that. This is a work in progress, Gordian coordinator, but you get the idea. Um, and finally, I want to uh, show off our uh, our Rust stack. Let me close these up here. And what you're seeing here is again, these are third party dependencies. These are all crates that are, you know, kind of well regarded in the community. We don't need to get into those, but um, everything you see here is standalone pure Rust. Um, uh, so, uh, at the very low end, we have our, our tools for random numbers and, and pseudo random numbers, which are often used for fuzzing and other kinds of testing in, in the rest of the libraries, which is why there's a number of dependencies on those. Um, our cryptographic libraries, which essentially are leveraged third-party crates for all the core cryptographic algorithms, um, and, you know, preferably reviewed crates where possible. Um, and then our, uh, pure Rust implementations, sh Shamir and B, uh, and SSKR on top of that, uh, our DC board implementation in Rust our UR implementation on top of that. Components, again, same same analogous to the, to the components library in uh, in Swift. Uh, and then our envelope imp implementation on top of that. And then the the uh, Depot API, this is basically if you want to build a client for our Depot server, which I'll be discussing uh, soon, then you'll use that. Uh, the, the Depot server itself uses that. And then we have a couple of command line tools written in Rust uh, for envelope, which is analogous. We, we talked about that uh, last meeting. Um, and then uh, an algorithm, uh, a, a, a command line tool for DC bore itself to to ingest uh, binary DC bore and then output the diagnostic format. So that's a high level overview, and I would just want to make sure that you know you, you kind of all had that picture in your mind because you know you, if you you know if you just do cargo run or cargo build on any of these, it'll pull in everything that's necessary automatically. Some of these things, in particular, like envelope has uh, a lot of uh, feature gates that if you don't need uh, certain things like cryptography or whatever, you can turn off the feature gate and it the, ultimately that will all compile out. That won't, uh, that won't uh, bloat your code. So, um, so, and obviously we'd like feedback on all of these things. So you can either open issues or you can contact me personally with questions or whatever. So this is, you know, this is your code. Essentially, this is the community's code. Um, I've written a lot of it, but it, there's also been uh, significant contributions by other people. So, um, uh, you know, we want your feedback and, you know, we ultimately, you know, but also remember that, you know, not all of this has been deeply reviewed. Uh, some of the C++ C++ uh, plus libraries have been deeply reviewed. We actually had a third party um, uh, security company come in and review our, in particular, our Shamir and SSKR implementations. And that, so that has been officially reviewed. These have not at this point, but they are basically based on the C++ uh, C libraries. And so ought to be the same, but, you know, until it's been reviewed, uh, we don't know. So, um, you know, you you are to a certain extent using these at your own risk, but but we believe that they are, uh, you know, um, they're useful and they're um, they're going to become more and more stable over time. So uh, that is the first uh, thing. Is there are there any questions at this point about that? 
I would like to to sort of raise the the you know a lot of people uh, we've had at least a few people say oh well there's too many dependencies and um uh i feel like that that's a mischaracterization of what we're trying to do what we've been trying to do is very careful layering so that different parts of the tools can be reused in different ways um, and to make sure that at any particular um, phase that if something changes or new technology emerges that you know we have planned for we can basically put in something into that particular slot um, uh, to adapt it so as an example Somebody brought up again this uh, last week about, oh, can't we do color QRs? Wouldn't that be a lot smaller? And, um, you know, due to the way that we've written this stuff, it would be fairly trivial for us to switch over to some, you know, emerging color QR standard. Um, whereas for many other libraries that are out there that, that do um, things in this category, they wouldn't be able to easily switch. They wouldn't, for instance, be able to do fountain codes or do some of the other different types of things. So there's a lot of careful layering, but we also are being very careful to not have, you know, too many security dependencies. Um, so we're not using lots of oddball crates and, and um, uh, you know, things of that nature. So it should be pretty easy to, uh, to, to review. Um, and then there's there is sort of we do have kind of some opinions about um, uh, keeping layers separate. Uh, you know, there I think we've seen the 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 decision of what happened when um, we kind of with addresses in Bitcoin put in the policy along with the keys. So like you know a number one at the beginning meant that meant more than oh this is just some you know identifier byte. It's we're very explicit. This is a legacy policy. So then we extended it and tried to do more policies. And then we had X pubs and then we had Y pubs and then we had capital Y and Z and all this hodgepodge of things that really made it difficult to be able to do a lot of the things and future proof ourselves to emerging things in Bitcoin. Um, uh, and that's because we've combined into what is really the intent is how do we transport reliably a uh, a uh, an address that you can send to uh, along with a lot of other policy type stuff that was um, uh, you know too tightly bound to it um, sometimes when you really understand something and there aren't a whole lot of other choices that's great but the reality is we want to kind of keep you know those types of things separate when we can because it does allow for future proofing and future um, ability to to uh, you know be adaptive uh, Wolf, do you want to say anything more about that? No, unless there's any other questions that we can move on. Okay. Um, let me sh go back to sharing the screen. Okay, so um, uh, at the last meeting, there was a lot of discussion about output descriptors. Um, we had a uh, previous uh, uh, research paper on this, which was um, really deserved to have become a, what we call a WIP, which is sort of the next stage in the open development process for these, uh, because it was implemented by multiple companies. Um, uh, but we also ran into, you know, both some problems with, um, uh, you know, some variations that were going on there, some changes in Bitcoin that were emerging, as well as, uh, you know, we were trying to do a binary version of this that was compatible with uh, uh, ITF and the IANA registry and ran into some challenges. So we wanted to address uh, these and uh, we, I don't think we did it in as graceful way as possible, but I think we're now, um, um, you know, ready to make a proposal. To be clear, this is a proposal. Um, you know, it doesn't deserve to become uh, a wallet improvement um, uh, uh, proposal until 
you know, we have some review by the community and some commitment and or actually implementation of the uh, new output descriptors in your uh, code bases. So uh, Wolf, do you wanna talk a little bit more about the, I also have the paper in a, in a tab. Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll pull up the paper. Um, I'll share my screen and pull up the paper. Um, one second here. Okay, share my screen. Okay, you should be seeing the UR type definition for Bitcoin output descriptors version three. Uh, and it's a shame we have to have three versions. I'm really, you know, uh, you know, but we we do we are iterating here and finding out what people want and need as we go. Uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to just go over the kind of I'm going to skim through this document because uh, I I'll recommend you definitely read it on your own. Uh, it's uh, uh, BCR 2023 010 in our research repository, um, and you know our research repository is deliberately named as research because it's not final, ready for deployment necessarily. And you know if you do so, we appreciate the feedback, but you know. Uh, we're, we're we're trying to solidify the higher levels of of stability uh, at this point, and so um, we want to make sure that any any wallet developers who build this, some things we we think we are regarding as very stable at this point, like uh, URs and DC bore and things like that. Other things, um, this is just you're seeing this for the first time now, so this is not anywhere near stable. And we're going we're introducing you know as Chris mentioned uh, higher levels of stability designations that will that we want to work with you guys on to make sure that you know, you feel confident moving forward, implementing uh, certain things that, they're, that they are in fact stable. Um, so um, uh, I'm just going to, you know, read a little bit of this, you know, just so, and if you have questions or whatever, um, please um, uh, either jump in, uh, jumping in verbally is probably the best thing. Uh, just go ahead and interrupt. <laughs> so output descriptors uh, are a way of specifying Bitcoin payment outputs. And you all know that. Uh, we're describing a native CBOR encoding for output descriptors, as well as a uniform resource type, uh, as well. And a UR, uh, a UR type includes a textual description for when it's encoded as a UR and a CBOR tag. And notice the CBOR tag is in the 40,000 range because we were using uh, lower number tags before. And now we've switched to using high number tags because these require less overview, re less review by IANA. Um, and we want to get these registered so that we're not, uh, we're not um, contending for these code points in the CBOR tag space. Um, I'm going to switch over real quickly to the IANA registry of CBOR tags. Um, and uh, as you'll see, there are three ranges they identify here. Zero to 23 is standards action, which basically by standards, they mean RFCs. They mean actual completed RFCs approved by IETF. Uh, where specification required um, is not at that level of scrutiny, but it does require review by IANA experts. Uh, and that was where we ran into started realizing we were running into issues when we tried to get a number of tags re registered for Gordian envelope in the low numbered range, 200, 300 range. Um, and we started running into resistance because uh, the, the way that they view it, this is this has to last a number of years in terms of uh, it's a, it's especially the lower number tags, especially what they call the zero plus one tags. Or, uh, these, these are all one byte. The lower number parts, these are, 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 are uh, uh, well, these are actually two bytes. Um, and, um, I'm sorry, so these are two or three bytes and these are three to eight bytes. Uh, and so they do take up more storage, but they say, but in this range, um, they say first come first served. So as you'll see, if I go down here to say 200, um, this is the tag we finally actually did acquire for, uh, for Gordian envelope. Uh, and uh, so it's part of our internet draft that was what was required. And that had to be reviewed by ANA experts before they would grant this code space, but that is forever, forever now a Gordian envelope if you see Seaboard Tag 200. So that's a baby step towards standardization. It's not, it's not standardization of the Gordian envelope, but it is basically um, the assignment of a code point. And so that does mean it's been independently reviewed, but not approved as an RFC at this point. So if we continue going down, you'll see that these higher, as we start getting get the higher numbers, especially after we get up to, to 32767, uh, here's 32768, um, so some of these have been assigned, nothing in the 40,000 range has been assigned yet. You see 32767 through 42599 are currently unassigned, which is why we chose to, um, start, uh, asking for tags in this area. And this is the first come first service. You see that these aren't associated with RFCs or even proposals. They're associated with people in many cases, uh, sometimes, uh, are sometimes RFCs and so on, but that's not required for this range. So 
um, this is the first come first serve range. And, and um, uh, so um, we've, as you'll see in a moment, I've, uh, uh, I've implemented a strategy where we're, uh, where we're using what's called type two tags now. Um, and if you go to the, uh, the papers or the version two tags, uh, if our, you, you go to our research repo and look at our, um, let's see, um, So if you look at our uniform uh, registry of uniform resource types, BCR 2020-006, um, again, BCRs are not like RFCs. They do get updated, whereas RFCs are fixed. And if they up update them, they assign a new RFC number, whereas BCRs are living documents. Um, so uh, as you can see, as we go down here, some of these uh, types, uh, for example, um, let's look at seed. So uh, tag 300, um, this is now deprecated but still supported so we've actually modified our code base so that it will read crypto seed urs or 300 tag seabor with no complaint but it prefers now to write seed ur seed uh and this tag uh, which is and all the new tags are basically just the old tags incremented by forty thousand. so um and so it's very clear which ones have been uh, assigned version two tags here and all the other documentation in the uh in the repo has been made uh uh, has been updated to reflect this, and uh, uh, our Swift code base has also been uh, updated to reflect this. Okay, so um, uh, so moving forward with the actual uh, output descriptor. So uh, this document gives an overview of the other two versions of output descriptors. The first one was pure Seabor, um, but we also realized that this used the lower number version one tags, and that would make it difficult to uh, you know have these tags to ourselves. Um, and uh, uh, another standard for uh, uh, um, output descriptor accounts was based on this and uh, and deployed by a developer. And we're very happy that they were that they're excited about that. We still want to support that. Uh, obviously, we realized that. And, and so, the the this this document um, and the other document that was based on it, um, while we're calling them deprecated, we're still saying these are still uh, supportable in terms of uh, uh, backwards compatibility. And we want to make sure that. Nothing that's out there in the wild gets, you know, um, uh, completely abandoned because people are relying on these things. Um, so version two was an attempt to move away from the low, these low numbered uh, tags uh, by basing uh, a uh, an output descriptor format on Gordian Envelope. Gordian Envelope um, is, you know, a container for various kinds of structured data. Um, uh, I won't get to the details right now for, but those of you who haven't uh, seen it before, please check it out. It's actually extremely useful. We're basing a lot of our stuff going on, on going forward. Um, but we did meet some resistance in terms of this format because some developers expressed a concern that it was too complex for their needs. I think that's debatable, but it's true that envelope format is not quite as simple as a pure form Seabor format would be. And plus, other things were raised, uh, like, for example, can we use, because this format relied on the textual output uh, descriptor format. It's basically a Gordian envelope wrapper for the, uh, uh, for the uh, output descriptor textual format. Um, and so there was no real size gain or anything like that on that. And so the actual, uh, actually making um, the output format, the output descriptor format much more compact while still providing for metadata and things like that, uh, you know, the community told us that, that was important. So we've deprecated this now and uh, we're not recommending, we're recommending anybody support this for backwards compatibility either. Um, uh, so, uh, so where does that leave us for this version? Uh, so we wanted to make it pure Seabor without requiring Gordian envelope. We wanted to have a compact encoding of keys. Uh, now, again, keys are part an essential part of output descriptors, but output descriptors can also include things like, well, uh, HD keys, BIP32 keys, um, EC keys, private or public, and Bitcoin uh, addresses. And these all have textual formats, but they also have more compact binary formats that we've already defined um, using uh, Seabor. Um, and so those are actually smaller. Um, so we also want to be able to represent all output descriptors that can be represented in the text format, not just a, mere, not just a subset. We also want to be able to adapt to future changes in the text format. And part of why we didn't entirely move away from the text format is because it's a living spec as well uh, and still evolving. Um, and we, But we also wanted it, uh, to add the ability to support metadata such as uh, name, note, and whatever the, else the community deems important. So, uh, so the solutions we decided is we're going to use 
Gordian de Seabor, which is a, the same thing we've been using. Uh, de Seabor is a deterministic subset of Seabor, and it's compatible with existing Seabor implementations. So it's basically just um, a restricted form of Seabor that is uh, more that is uh, that affords determinism. Uh, and not all applications require determinism, but we're basing everything we do on it. Um, so uh, we're also using the text form of output descriptors, but we're replacing the keys with in index placeholders. And this is something that Seed Hammer brought to our attention. Uh, and so we definitely appreciate that because this is a great idea. Um, so uh, we you know, are extracting the the uh, textual versions of the keys. Actually, we're doing it in our in our unparser, which is what turns the our internal format into the textual format. Uh, and uh, we're as we unparse it, we're basically outputting em emitting the keys themselves as uh, 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 as the internal format, the Swift format, as well as uh, these these placeholders. So. Um, and then the Seaborn encoded keys are included in a separate array corresponding to the placeholder indexes. And you'll see some examples of that in a moment. So this affords compactness while allowing the text format to evolve without requiring changes to the Seaborn format. Uh, we are also using the text, uh, and using the text format means that clients of this format still need to be able to parse the text format, but there's pretty much third-party libraries for that purpose already. Um, so, you know, and we have our own as well in our uh, uh, BC Foundation, the library I showed you earlier that basically parses and unparses uh, uh, output descriptors uh, according to the specification, which is again a living specification. It's not a form fixed specification at this point. Uh, so encoding this format may be a bit more challenging because the text format will either need to be output with placeholders or the keys will need to be extracted from the text format either by textual manipulation or specialized walking of the abstract syntax tree, which is what we're doing. Um, and the use of placeholders though is optional. So, uh, and indeed the ability to parse and or understand the output descriptor textual format are not required for writing this format because you can just basically wrap the textual output descriptor if you, if you, if that's all you need to do, um, uh, because complete textual output descriptors can simply be wrapped without using placeholders. Um, however, to read this format, the ability to parse placeholders and substitute the decoded keys for them is a requirement. So, um, we realized that part of the effort here would be to include, you know, uh, compact representations of the keys, and that includes HD keys, EC keys, and Bitcoin addresses. We already have specs for those, and those now have been graduated to version two tags uh, in the forty thousand range. And uh, and so, if you go to any of these specs, you'll see that there. Uh, other than that, these these haven't changed. So, uh, and all our code now accepts both version one and version two tags for reading, and writes version two tags only. Uh, so. Uh, and um, that's essentially what I'm saying there. So now the CDDL, the CDDL is the concise data definition language. This is how you define this, the uh, the syntax of uh, CBOR. Um, and uh, I briefly want to note here that I mentioned uh, the cosigner type, which is essentially something that we're, uh, it, because it's now part of the textual descriptor here, it doesn't need any special treatment, but it is still there. It was in our previous output descriptor format, version one. Um, and uh, uh, so, but I want to continue to support that so that, you know, we're declaring that it's supported here. Um, and then uh, here's the actual formal description of the output descriptor. It's just the, the Seaboard tag and then the source text, which, you know, if the, you have keys replaced by, uh, by placeholders in this text, and you'll see examples of that in a moment, then uh, an optional array of keys. So you can either, you know, use placeholders or not, but if you have at least one extracted key, it has to be in this, uh, uh, in this array. Um, and then an optional name and an optional note. And so as you can see, it's, it's trivially easy to add additional um, uh, metadata if we need to, but it, that does need to be part of the spec because you need to know what keys to expect. This is a set of key value pairs in a Seaborn map. And these are the actual integer values that are assigned to, to these. So this, uh, this is not text in our Seaborn. This is actual um, uh, encoded integers. And that's important to keep in mind if you're not too familiar with Seaborn. And so this key uh, can be an HD key which is defined in 2007, uh, EC key in 08, and address in 09. It could be any of those. Let me also um, uh, briefly talk here about some of the design considerations that, that uh, are longer term. Um, as we move to a world where we can have multi-sig described in a, in a output descriptor, but it could also be a world where you know, in fact, something is happening offline using, say, Frost or Musig or whatever that results in a single key uh, that is used in an output descriptor. We need to be able to have this additional metadata 
um, because you may need to describe, oh, well, this in fact is a you know frost uh, aggregated uh, signature, or this is something you know unusual that is you know happening offline. You know, some kind of adapter signature needs to be added in. We don't have things for that, and we wanted to be able to have the flexibility to add that kind of information. There also may be other very trivial things that we really would like to have sooner than later to add to this metadata. Like maybe you would like to, you know, put in the date that the descriptor was created for some reason, um, or um, you know, this descriptor is, you know, uh, exclusively used for, you know, some other protocol like Lightning or RGB or whatever. So, you know, we would like to hear from you, what are these other things that are not part of the Bitcoin output put descriptor format, but, you know, you would really like to see as made metadata about it. So, yeah, that's it. Okay. So I think I redundantly included the talk about cosigner here. I'll edit that. Um, and then I give some example test ve ve vectors here. Um, and these are basically drawn from our other test vectors for, uh, uh, and if, if you go to our Swift code base and look at all our test vectors, they're very good examples of how this actually plays out. But for example, this is a uh, uh, pay to public key script uh, and it's 70 bytes as text. Um, this is what the uh, the substituted uh, output descriptor looks like with a placeholder. And this is the actual, what's called um, um, uh diagnostic format of Seabor. The actual binary itself is much more compact than this, uh, but this is the human readable form of Seabor and it begins with the tag. Then this is the key value pairs, one, two, one is the source, two is the uh, the actual key array. And so here's the array, here's the uh, version two tag for an EC key. Uh, and then three basically is the actual key data. So, um, and uh, the actual hex encoded uh, CBOR, or the, the actual hex uh, encoded CBOR is 54 bytes. So in this case, the original output script is 70 bytes. The new uh, CBOR encoded is 54 bytes. Um, big and, is the, you know, so uh, if I take the, how big is that in uh, binary and how big is that in, um, say, a UR? So it, uh, UR is essentially um, there. So, okay. Um, this is the binary format of Seabor. So if you emit just the pure Seabor, uh, and this is the hex representation, which is double that. So this is 108 characters, but it's 54 bytes if you actually admit it as binary. When you wrap something as a UR, um, you are taking each byte and turning it into two um, English letters and th that are from the byte words uh, uh, gamut from zero to 256. Um, and while that's not particularly efficient in itself, it is very efficient when encoded in QR codes and it's easy to handle for humans. So it's not necessarily the most, it, the, 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 the point of UR is not necessarily to be the most efficient way of handling things when it comes to pure binary, but it is actually better when it comes to uh, putting in QR codes. It's better than base 64 or anything like that when you put them in QR codes. Um, and so the actual UR would be about this long in terms of number of characters, plus um, a four character uh, um, uh, CRC32 at the end and the type at the beginning that replaces the tag. So there would be, it'd be UR colon output descriptor, then approximately the same number of characters, uh, and then four, uh, uh, um, eight additional characters for the four byte uh, CRC32 at the end. Um, so it's recognizable as opposed to just a pure text string like this. Uh, it's recognizable uh, by its type, UR colon output descriptor. Um, and um, uh, and it's handleable. It is, a, it is a conformant URI. So you can use it anywhere a URI is syntactically accepted. Uh, and it's also very compact when you use them in, UR, in QR codes. And that's basically, you know, the kind of one of the design parameters of the UR, uh, of the UR type. And, and, and uh, so... Uh, it's important to understand that when going forward, it's not, you know, it's not trying to replace, uh, you know, um, base 64, but if you put base 64 in a QR code, you actually get less efficient encoding. You actually get a denser QR code than if you use a UR because URs are very limited in terms of the number of characters they use. And therefore they take advantage of the QR codes, uh, alphanumeric encoding mode. Uh, all right. So um, take another example here. This is another one where we have uh, an, an output description, which is an address. And this is a, uh, a testnet address. Um, and it codes down to address with a placeholder. And then this is our uh, our described address format, which includes coin info saying what what, what uh, um, 
type and network it, this address is intended to work with um, and whether it's a private or public, uh, not a private or public address, but uh, that's for keys. But um, I forget what field two is. Oh, it's depth. No, no, it's not depth. <laughs> I forget. I forget. I have to look it up. But yeah, this basically is uh, key value two. And key value three is the is the actual um, is the actual uh, um, public key hash uh, of a uh, of a of an address. So, but this is the format of the address that's described in one in our BCR that I mentioned above, um, and you know it looks verbose here, but it's actually very compact binary wise. So in this case, because this is already base fifty eight encoded, uh, the uh, this is forty eight bytes. Uh, in our case, the actual hex encoded CBOR is a little bit larger, um, but it's consistent you know, with everything else. Um, we could. Uh, if we really care, uh, you know, actually not encode this, we could actually use the the uh, base fifty eight encoding here, uh, and you know, and, and regain some of that space back. That's totally allowable. Uh, but if you, but as you'll see, in most cases, the actual uh, format uh, results in a reduction in size, not an increase in size. Um, so moving on, uh, we have a pay to public key hash here. This is in WIF format. So this is a, when you're going to put an EC public uh, private key into an output descriptor. Uh, then it's in WIF format, and our code parses and unparses the WIF format uh, for that. This is the actual um, uh, output descriptor rep representation of that. Um, and this is an EC key. This true means this is a private key, and this is the key material. Uh, and so this is 57 bytes. So we only uh, we actually gained one byte here for the buyer format. And again, this isn't the prime example of how this will be used because I'm about to move on to a much more vivid example of how the compactness uh, actually plays out. So this is the uh, descriptor for a two of three multi-sig wallet, uh, including the use of a name field to give it the uh, the name Satoshi Stash. And you may recognize this this, this Seed Hammer's example. Uh, so this is a uh, wallet script hash, a sorted multi, a threshold of two. Um, there's a, a three keys with a path, uh, both with a derivation prefix as well as a, a child derivation suffix. Um, and these are all defined in the textual format for output descriptors, but these are also encoded in our binary format for output descriptors, which is why when you uh, extract them out, you you all you get is zero uh, at zero at one at two as your placeholders. So the actual uh, CBOR with uh, uh, with the HD key diagnostic notation, I've made it for brev brevity. Uh, you can look at the full diagnostic output here, but it's basically the actual text format followed by the array of the three HD keys and then the name Satoshi Stash. So the actual original um, output descriptor is 448 bytes. Um, in our case, the hexo uh, code, uh, encoded output descriptor is 405 bytes. And then I note here that uh, this encoding is 405 bytes. Well, the text format is 448 bytes, even without the user to assign name. So the user assigned name, of course, is taking up some space as well. Um, so it's not like direct apples to oranges comparison. Seed Hammer's proposal um, comes in at 396 bytes, slightly smaller. So for this example, the present CBOR encoding base is only larger by nine bytes, which I think basically, you know, to, to base things on CBOR and establish standards and have, and also gain the advantage of fully supporting the um, the output descriptor format, uh, including all the edge cases and things like that. Um, I think that's a uh, a worthwhile trade-off. Um, I think that Seed Hammer's proposal, while very, you know, uh, got the conversation going, uh, I, I don't think it addresses all the cases that we actually ended up addressing to create this spec. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think, you know, CBOR being a standard, we can discuss this if there's any questions or concerns, but I think that this does meet the, uh, requirement for being, uh, compact, uh, as well as expressive of the full range of, uh, of output scripter uh, values. So, um, I'd <clears throat> like to take some questions. Well, I also, I want to, you know, add here again, we're, you know, future proofing ourselves in a couple of different ways, as you will see in a discussion about um, the depository tool, um, you know, these things can be put inside other objects that are CBOR objects that are, say, encrypted or use SSKR or use other different types of um, tools that we're building. And, you um, uh, this gives you a lot of flexibility in your designs to be able to do different types of things. Um, there are also, you know, maybe some advantages in the future when we talk about different kinds of, uh, of um, hardware keys that, you know, these structures, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, can be alighted in a variety of interesting ways or, you know, can refer to another um, 
uh, seabore structure in the you know in the overall object, uh, et cetera. So I think there's some real we you know we've tried to think about this in the context of a larger ecosystem, which might not necessarily include oh you trust you know this uh, output descriptor and it's you know potentially uh, you know valuable. Um, uh, identifiers that could be used to track the parties that are involved in the multi-sig and be able to uh, add some privacy to it. So um, I just wanted to say that we are, you know, we're, you know, this does fit into the larger picture of why we chose CBOR and DCBOR and some of the different types of things we've chosen with envelope and with the Gordian, um, sorry, Gordian seal. What's the name of the? Gordian sealed transfer protocol. And I'll explain what, that a little bit later, what that's about. I did want to say it fits into a larger context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to. I was trying to, uh, you know, sh uh, show the that context when I showed the 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 DEPA, uh, the depository uh, repository overview at the beginning, uh, because that kind of sh shows that we're trying to, for very clean separation of responsibilities between layers. So you only use the layers you need, um, and uh, and we're trying to basically you know build solutions which once they're moved to a particular language or platform then they can be built on by other people in, in a very kind of uh uniform way so uh for instance you know in rust uh we have uh, our, our our own ur implementation of our own standard but we're actually not using we're just shimming a third party's ur development uh ur library in rust uh, because it does pretty much everything we need to do but we wanted to kind of uh modify its api slightly for to be consistent with the rest of our code so we just shimmed it but we didn't have to implement our own ur spec for our ur for our rust ur library now we might eventually do that at some point but it doesn't really matter because the third party library works great so we actually saved ourselves some effort by um working with the community uh what the community's done so that's that's the whole, a big part of the idea of our open development um cycle here is that we're all working with each other here to create a better set of tools for that ultimately benefits the end users uh so um, are there any questions on this at this point? Uh, obviously, this was a big point of uh, of discussion last time. This is the kind of fruits of that labor that I've been doing since then. And uh, you know, if there's any initial reactions to this, I'd love to hear it. Craig or Ken? Seed hammer. I'd like to comment. I think it's look. It looks great. It has the same features as uh, as the other proposal. It's compact. It's uh, Expressive still. Um, you could discuss whether to include easy keys or not. I, I don't. I'm not expert enough to know whether that is a good idea. Um, I guess the elephant in the room is 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 the underlying format. Seabor uh, versus PSPT, um, and I, I'm guessing. I'm guessing what what are your comments on that? I don't know if you've seen uh, my posting on the Bitcoin Dev uh, uh, mailing list. One thing I did. Uh, compared to the original proposal, uh, hashtag the 135, is to, to ask whether it should it, the proposal should not be a separate file format using the PSPT encoding, but instead be a PSPT extension. And there was at least one, res there was one response that said, that pretty much said that, uh, I, can, I can link to it here. But the pertinent part is that, um, the response is, I think the goal of such a format would be, should be that it is uh, already a valid PSPT or can uh, trivially be con converted into one. So I guess the, the uh, an alternative to the to our original proposal is um, proposing it as a PSPT extension, which gets around all the questions of a different file format. Um, and it also somehow, somewhat gets around the uh, the issue of the file form being proprietary. So the original proposal was ha just happened to use the same encoding um, as PSPT itself. But it's correct that I think that uh, Wolf brought up that it's still a proprietary encoding. It's still a, a, a different file form, but it's still, it's still a different thing, even though you can't just happen to be uh, able to use the same uh, codec libraries that you use for PSPT. So um, I, I guess my question is with that, uh, with the proposal being an extension to PSPT, what's your comment on that uh, compared to this uh, um, output descriptor version three? Yeah, the the main the main reservation I've always had about the idea of extending PSPT is it was designed 
uh, I think in, I think the original PSPT spec specification was actually kind of designed in a vacuum uh, and they probably did not review other things like Seabor because there's no rationale for why, for example, they did not go with Seabor at the beginning. Um, and so in the absence of that, I have to assume they were either unaware of it or, or uh, deselected it for unknown reasons. Um, but uh, when we decided to, you know, as part of building our stack, we looked at many, many different binary formats. Uh, in fact, that's if you go back and look at like my Seabor, why Seabor video that I did some time ago, um, I, I, you know, I, I have a slide with literally dozens of formats on it that we reviewed and compared. Um, and we we chose Seabor because it has a, a wide, it's an RFC, first of all, it has a huge amount of uh, community support around it. It's got an active working group on various extensions, which is how we're working with uh, uh, with that community to uh, to uh, proffer DCBOR, uh, Deterministic CBOR, our, our Deterministic subset of CBOR, which is now an internet draft and hopefully will become an RFC someday. Um, and there's just a huge amount of tooling and support around that, including things like CDDL for defining schemas and uh, and CBOR.me, which is for, you know, inputting and outputting um, diagnostic format, you know, uh, translating back and forth between hex and diagnostic format. Um, just There's just, you know, a whole ecosystem around it that there just isn't, and I can't believe it ever will be around PSBT's format. And so, um, you know, we're trying to do things, you know, in a way that, you know, we're trying to do things for the ages. And um, uh, and so, you know, I, I think it would have been nice if PSBT had been based on Seabor, uh, but uh, I, I, because it wasn't, it doesn't tell me that that's not a compelling reason to me personally to say, well, now we should start basing everything in the, you know, that touches Bitcoin uh, on that format. It's not a bad format. It does what it needs to do for, uh, you know, so I'm not knocking it for its, singular purpose but i think that we're trying to access a larger number of purposes and to do that we really want to leverage things that have a, a basis in the standards community and give us the advantages that we need which is you know why we took such a time to so carefully review the, the various kinds of uh, uh of binary uh uh encoding formats that are out there yeah also like earlier this year there was some discussion about using um um I'm forgetting the bit, but it's basically being able to sign with Bitcoin descriptors and uh, other different types of things. And there ends up being some interesting policy implications. You know, um, uh, there may be some interesting, uh, you know, variants and stuff. And we really wanted to be able to support a variety of these um, uh, futures, whereas Bitcoin descriptors was very much oriented to what the limitations are of Bitcoin core. Um, and, uh, um, you know, where, you know, I don't see Bitcoin core, you know, uh, signing messages, uh, ever again, <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, but I think there are a variety of things that wallets will need to do, um, that are important there. And then, you know, there are maybe scenarios where, you know, you can't trust the, 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 the medium that you're, you know, transporting. I mean, we're already, copying too much to the clipboard and there are too many tools that look at the clipboard and so you know we also have the ability in the future to do things where we're wrapping these in you know various kinds of tofu encryption stuff so that you know a uh, uh, a sneaky uh you know snoop on um, the places where we transport these kinds of things can't uh, grab this information so I just feel like there's a it, some important things there that um, are beyond just the narrow definition of uh, of a Bitcoin's descriptor that can be used by Bitcoin Core. But I'm open to if other people have other opinions. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the time. This is our discussion forum. For, so please, if you have other thoughts, um, you know, uh, fully baked, half baked, whatever, please, you know, uh, let, let's move the conversation forward now. I, I think we've, you know. We've stepped up. We've created this this uh, thing to try to address the concerns. If you read the document itself, you know it basically lays out all the concerns we've tried to address and and how we've chosen to address them. And so, um, you know, we need feedback. Can we at least agree that PSPT still is already very embedded in the Bitcoin community and uh, with respect yeah. to communicating between controllers? Sorry, uh, well, coordinators. We support PSPT devices. in our yeah. We support B PSPT. Uh, and that's exactly my point. If, if, if in our code base, if you support because we have to. Yeah, you, you have to. Uh, but not as a generic that's, that's, binary encoding format. No, no, no. But the, you have to support PSPT, and that's part of the point. Uh, I think the point of PSPT versus Seabor is that it's very, very, very simple to implement. I did a few, as, as I said, a few hundred of lines. 
I think it's complete. Well, if it's not complete, it's only lacking a very few features. Let me actually and be very clear. Still, our, yeah. our, our code base supports it by using libwally. Okay, so we're using libwally's implementation of that. So mm -hmm. uh, we did not even have to implement that because that was implemented by libwally. So when we encode and decode PSBTs, um, we're using libwally. We, and we're writing our own shims on top of that to make it more um, useful for Swift uh, in the in more natural in the Swift environment. But we did not have to implement that ourselves. And that's one of the advantages of going of the existing PSBT format, but that doesn't apply to all these other formats that might be based on a similar schema to PSBT. Uh, Libwally is probably not going to implement the output descriptor format you're proposing. So, yeah, but that's we'll, what, we'll that's what I'm that. saying. It's it's um, um, and a variant of my proposal is because it's using the same PSBT encoding, the Libwally will support uh, output descriptors as well. I, It'll just have a yes because it's 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 uh, it's just I, an unknown uh, identifier. It'll well, still use the I, same. I would have to see that because right now it's it's uh, it's API doesn't include anything to do with generic PSPTs. It's just uh, it's you know it's basically a uh, you know all, all the APIs say PSBT this PSBT that not not anything else not output descriptor not and nothing like that. So. Um, what you're proposing, I think, is really just a, a new binary output uh, encoding no, format no, that would compete with Seymour. No, 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 it's not. It's it's the it's an extension to a, PSPT has extension uh, is extensive because it has this field identifiers that says this is the kind of field. This is the kind. it has a key. Very basically, it's 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 maps. So where every map entry can have a key and a value, and it has an ID in the form of a, an integer. That integer tells what is the purpose of this entry. What is the what is the semantic meaning of this entry? But there's no diff in my proposal, I'm not encoding the output description a different way. I'm just like you, I'm I'm reserving, I intend to reserve it, at least if I push this forward, I intend to reserve uh, reserve an identifier, a PSPT uh, map entry identifier saying output descriptor or whatever, and then specifying that the value will be the text the well, user yeah, let's let's. I mean, we should. Uh, this getting into a little bit detail, and and you know, I'd love to go into it, but let's just be you know clear on two different issues. One is that you know there is sort of a weird collision of layers here. One of which is a storage format that allows you to store these things securely, transfer them securely, versus something that maybe is something that is more you know manipulable, copyable, copy and paste, select text, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel like those are not absolutely incompatible. I mean, I imagine that you could probably, you know, coerce your kind of text format into uh, a store, you know, a binary storage format and back very, very easily. Uh, but I also feel like, you know, this is also where, you know, we have put down, you know, something, uh, some details of a particular proposal. But in the end, if, you know, uh, you, Craig, can other people all say no? We want to use the the descriptor format um, that you know you have recommended, or some variation thereof. Um, you know, then our answer would be okay. Well, you know, this was uh, uh, a useful discussion, and let's uh, let's just wrap your uh, you know your format in a you know in a in a different. 40,000 tag if we if that's what the community wants to do. So I just want to be clear, this is an open, you know, we are an open development organization and, uh, uh, you know, we're trying to serve what we heard as the needs, um, uh, but we're not, you know, this is not a, a standard. Um, this is a, a, a research uh, document and it's really kind of up to, um, you know, the community that is actually shipping wallets uh, to, to leverage it. So, um, you know, we'll, we will adapt to whatever, uh, the, you know, the community decides, which generally is, you know, two unrelated companies, you know, wanting to interoperate, um, you know, so. Yeah. I'd also like to just raise one other issue, uh, that, uh, you know, which is that if you are going to extend PSBT and I understand it was designed to be extensible, I understand it's a map. Uh, and of course, you know, we're using a map in Seaboard as well. So, uh, that functionality has some has some parallelism there. The question is, okay, so it, it started out as partially signed Bitcoin transactions. Now you're extending it for output descriptors. The next thing that comes along, you're going to extend it again. The next thing that comes along, you're going to extend it again. 
where do you draw the line between when when you continue to use that and when you say, well, why, why didn't we just use Seaboard in the first place? We're supporting but PSBTs that, because that's they exactly are, all, are because they're already widely yeah, deployed. But a binary form of output descriptors is not already widely deployed, and we're trying to to and we're basically drawing the line ourselves and saying, um, going forward, we think everybody should be using Seaboard for as much as possible. PSBTs that 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 you know the 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 horse is already out of the barn there, so we support it. We we wrap it with a tag. Um, and uh, uh, whereas everything else going forward, including things that are much more sophisticated, uh, Gordian envelope and things like that, um, we're choosing to base on Seabor because it's just it's designed to be way more flexible in terms of its ecosystem and its support and its community and standardization than PSPT was ever intended for. So but it does require uh, a full decoding library, right? No, but yeah, but it's, you can decode Seabor. You can deco decode uh, Seabor in a very small number of lines of code. Yeah, there, there are some very tiny Seabor encoding decoding libraries uh, that are designed. And Seabor was originally designed with uh, uh, minimal codecs in mind. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, and, and there are numerous third-party implementations, and some of which are extremely tiny. So I, I suggest you, you you take a look at some of those implementations and see how tiny mm -hmm. they really are. We also last month discussed, right, just hard coding um, specific implementations. If you're in a resource constrained environment, you know, you can just encode or decode the tags that you. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to be a no, full. You, you can't do that. No, you can't do that for decoding. That's that's not true. If you decode, you have to support everything that is specified. That's not true. DC board. That's not true. Depending on, on the format you're decoding, because if you know that you're what you're getting is say an output descriptor, and you know there's no floating point values in it, for instance, then you don't need your DC, your C board decoder does not need to support floating point values. So that's that's one trivial example, but there's many others. Yeah, there and also because it's a de deterministic C board, I mean everything kind of rolls the same way. Um, you can create a fairly primitive parser uh, for well known well known uh, values of things. So. You don't have to, um, at least to to parse uh, or write Seabor. You you know you 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 don't have to have a full parser. And you even even if you're doing PSBT, like really, if we look at what's on screen here, you know this is just like some identifier and some map keys and some values. Like the code is very very similar. Um, for me as an engineer, I would like rather use something that is intended from the beginning to be extended, and and has the ecosystem, as Wolf says, versus sort of take, you know, the fact that there happened to be a couple hundred lines of code already written for PSBT shouldn't be the reason, I think, that you choose a particular format. Great. Yeah, I, I would I would uh, agree with you there, Ken. Um, I, I think this is a good proposal. I like the fact that you've listened to the community uh, and gone for a versioned um, update rather than just something which was completely different. So I think you know that is noted. I like the code reuse, uh, which you've done here. I think that that's very help helpful. Um, and I like the fact that it's just really quite simple um, in terms of the approach. We haven't, there's no, feels like, uh, you know, you have to get the version three, which is a step back from the version two. Uh, and kind of just does what it needs to do. And it feels very much like that is the case here. So um, I like, like it and uh, it seems like this will work. Thank you, Greg. Let's move on to, cause this sort of is beginning to also touch the territory of our of our next, you know, um, uh, question. So, um, you know, uh, there are 13 plus wallets now that support uh, the UR format, in particular, the animated uh, uh, QRs for PSBTs. Um, I don't know how many uh, wallets support some of the other UR things. Uh, I know, you know, uh, Craig supports the old uh, URs for the old crypto um, output, uh, but I'm not quite sure as, if as many people do it. And then we really, as far as I know, never really had anybody adopt some of the, uh, the uh, you know, more advanced uh, UR uh, variants. So the 13 plus wallets are all PSBTs. Uh, CoinKite recently introduced BBQR, which also does animated QRs. It's slightly more compact, but mostly because it doesn't use fountain codes. 
Um, it only does PSBTs and it's kind of locked into that and it's incompatible with URs. And, um, you know, uh, you know, let's, assuming good intentions, um, you know, why did they do that? Um, well, one reason why they say they did it was, oh, well, there were too many dependencies. And I'm kind of like, okay, well, maybe you misunderstand the dependencies, or maybe we can write some kind of mono repo um, or something of that nature. Because right now, I, I will say, you know, we, you know, partly just because of constraints on our team's time and budgets, you know, um, our revenues uh, as a uh, not-for-profit, you know, you know, getting money from patrons and not selling product uh, is uh, uh, lower this year. We just haven't received as much this year as we have in previous years. So we haven't done a great job in kind of having, okay, here is a single document that describes everything you know, need to know to do a uh, PSBT in a, in a UR. It's kind of spread across a couple of different documents and such uh, for good reasons, but there's no reason why other than just the time we couldn't write something that was just about that. So in theory, based on the two, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, comments from CoinKite on why they want to use BBQR uh, rather than URs, uh, I think we can, we could address them. It, um, but I think it's more important. You are the real community. Uh, I invited them here. They're not here today, unless somebody snuck in while I wasn't looking. Um, and would welcome them to participate in this community. But you are the real people who decide on what our priorities are. So, you know, are we not meeting the requirements? Um, can we make it simpler with a, you know, more dedicated, uh, um, I don't want to call it a fork, but a, a subset of our reference code just to do one thing or a minimal number of things. And, you know, do we really need to spend the time to write that kind of combined, uh, you know, wallet improvement proposal and turn it into a sort of a BIP style singular document, um, which, to be honest, will just take a lot of time when we want to, you know, move forward on some of these other things. So hey, Christopher, I also have a demo I'd like to give when you finish, uh, because I think it would actually, I'd like to kind of make sure people understand the value proposition of what we've done compared to what CoinKite is proposing. Sure. Um, but so at the end of that, you know, think about what is that you're looking for. And if some kind of UR 2.1 in particular for PSBTs or maybe PSBTs plus crypto output and a couple of others, um, uh, you know, would help you and how important is that compared to some of the other uh, things that, you know, we can uh, facilitate because our job is to serve the wallet community and make sure that those people who want to interop and want to work together and want to do open source and want to do open development together uh, um, is served because when we have that interoperability, we're really serving the user and that's the, our you know, it's indirect, you know, we don't get customers coming to us directly, but we're trying to preserve the, the you know, privacy and security of the self-sovereign uh, users. So um, that's our real goal. And, you know, you know uh, we're, you know, what do you want to see us do? Okay, go, go ahead and take over the screen. Um, I would yeah. just say quickly, like, as far as um, CoinKite is concerned, you're going to have a hard time getting them to adopt UR as it is because they're going to have to implement their own version of it because they're not open source anymore. Um, so they're source viewable, source available, but their license is not compatible uh, with a lot of the open source licenses now. So, well, our our license is BS two uh, is a is is a uh, was it BSD? No, what's uh what is our license, Christopher? Uh, what's our what? It's BSD plus patent. Right, BSD plus patent. So, I mean, as far as I know, they could use, I mean, and I'd There's, be very surprised if, they, I mean, are, have they warranted that they use no open source software whatsoever? That seems they improbable. They replaced all the Trezor code with their own um, implementation, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, their I mean, Commons clause license. So um, they just might, I, I'm hope maybe there's a way to do it. It'd be great if there was, but um, as far as I know, that that kind of blocked them out to a bunch of open source code. 
Not well, that would indicate why they're being trying to be low effort. <laughs> so, uh, but let me let me show you this real quick. This is uh, we have demoed this in a different uh, uh, in a different uh, um, in a different video uh, at some point. You should be seeing uh, uh, my iPhone screen. This is actually uh, uh, my Mac screen showing my literal iPhone screen right now. So, and, and it's running UARKit demo. I also have the uh, iOS simulator on my computer running the same demo. So if I pull up my screen here, see there is the actual, I'm um, showing you the simulator it, itself now running that. And this is the, this is right now, this uh, is the UARKit demo app. And right now it's looking for QR codes. Um, and so uh, if I start, for example, to just say, uh, I'm gonna choose um, one kilobyte, 250 byte fragments, uh, which is total length of 24.4 and a maximum fragment size of 250, you'll see that as soon as I click this, it starts reading and it's basically finished reading it at this point. I'm gonna actually turn on the sound here so you can hear that a little bit. So um, let me say what you do here. And then I'm going to actually come back here and choose a much larger one. And I'm gonna let it run for a moment here as well. Uh, I'm going to put it mostly off screen so it can't read the QR code, but you'll still see it. Now you see it's actually going through a, a, a fairly high amount of data here. And as you see, it's actually reading pretty big chunks of this data. You see the, the, the progress bar at the bottom is an estimate. But the point is it didn't have to actually cycle through all the fragments of this. Um, you can see it's actually each fragment is, sorry, let me read the camera here, is a mix here. So there's a mix of fragments in each one that are XORed together. Uh, and this is the rateless fountain codes. Um, now, of course, the, the density of the code and, and the, the speed at which you run it are all uh, variables that you can adjust. But let's actually try, for example, um, 10 kilobytes here. So I want to point out that you notice how it's it's actually, actually, let me try 10 kilobytes at much smaller fragment size. Uh, let's see, yeah, 10 kilobytes, 250 byte fragments. So notice if I just move it away and move it back, it's actually caught some of the initial ones coming through and now it's going back and filling in the gaps. And I can basically miss as many codes as I want to and it still actually recovers very quickly. Um, and that is a big part of the value proposition of this. The first cycle of fragments is just the actual original data. So if you catch it from the beginning, you only need one read of each QR code. Whereas uh, if you catch it in the middle or miss one along the way, you don't have to wait for all of them to be recycled. That's the actual... Uh, value of using fountain codes. And it really is an opt-in thing. You don't even have to use the fountain codes because what we're doing at the beginning with the initial set of fragments is essentially the same thing that uh, that uh, that BBQR was doing. So, um, uh, you know, so I'm, and of course, you know, because these are URs in there, they're encoded using the very efficient alphanumeric format, which BBQR says, hey, we're using the very efficient alphanumeric uh, format. That's great. You know, uh, uh, glad they arrived at the same conclusion we did. We're using URs. They're using, you know, their was a base thirty-two or whatever, uh, base thirty-six. So, um, you know, and they're using a, a compression format on top of that. You know, Gordian envelope supports that if you really need something like deflate compression. So, um, you know, I think we're offering a lot of advantages that are opt-in, whereas they're saying this is the way that you know we're basically going to kind of be the the six hundred pound gorilla. Personally, I think the community should be the six hundred pound gorilla. So that's 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 my that's my opinionated take on this. Yeah. Um, we had a question from Ori. So yes, uh, there is uh, very good references for all of this uh, in the research repo, good reference code. It's implemented in, I think, five or six languages now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what we don't have is kind of what I would call an ITF style uh, reference um, to it. Uh, that is, or a BIP style, you know, complete reference. It's, a, you know, a little bit split over different places because some of the individual components are reused. So although the animation uh, is very efficient with the fountain codes and things of that nature, part of that efficiency works because of the, the you know, the, the, U, the uh, text URs that we uh, that we use that could also be used over signal or over you know other um, non QR uh, transports. Um, but if you'd like some tips uh, to do that, there are, you know also are some interesting things. Fountain codes uh, have some interesting uh, patent issues for some variants of them, and we chose one that was, uh, as far as we know, um, uh, free and clear. 
So there are some more efficient fountain code uh, variations uh, out there that are patent encumbered. Um, so uh, I hope that uh, that helps. Yeah, the actual uh, uh, to um, Ori's question, um, the and to address what Christopher was saying, yeah, we don't have a single document that you would implement uh, UR and fountain codes from at this point. Um, and what we what we do is, and if you look at the actual UR document, uh, I'm actually going to put the uh, link in the chat here. Um, is uh, we describe our methodologies in general, and then we do refer you to the reference implementation in Swift, and particularly the actual um, uh, unit tests, which actually are built up in a logical way, such that if you implement the unit tests in order, you have by the time you're done, you have a completely working UR implementation, and that's how the several third-party developers have gone through and implemented this. We should at some point actually turn this into an IETF style um, standalone uh, implementation guide uh, that you should be able to implement from without any reference to, to the code. Um, but uh, it's you know we haven't had the resources to do that at this point, and that hasn't stopped people. Uh, I think, and I think that's really important. People have had success um, doing this uh, at this point, and um, uh, and yeah, if you don't need the fountain codes, the implementation is actually pretty trivial because, and you probably can implement that from the UR spec alone. If you want the fountain codes, yeah, you do need to look a little bit how we're doing it, uh, how we're choosing random numbers, uh, you know, because they're pseudo random that the client uh, that both sides have to agree on, uh, how we're uh, how we're. Uh, creating the probability distribution of what we're going to include, things like that. There's specific code for that that's based on you know well understood uh, algorithms uh, that we've chosen and documented in the code. So um, that doesn't need to be at some point broken out into a separate spec. But for now, uh, you know, it's what's there is is useful and stable, and several people have implemented it. And like I say, even for our Rust library, we went and implemented our UR additional um, functionality on top of a third party UR library because it already existed in Rust. Sort of related to that, you know, in the uh, in the non fountain code um, that is, uh, you could print those on multiple sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to have it doesn't have to be a uh, an animated medium. Um, you know, you could you know start at the end of the fountain codes and go to the beginning, uh, end of the you know the the stack and go to the beginning, and it will order them properly when you, after you've scanned all the images. Uh, and basically it's designed for anything that is, um, uh, you know, binary Seaboard. So it isn't locked into um, uh, only say Bitcoin PSVTs. It's generally useful for anything that can be uh, described in Seaboard, which is part of why at the beginning of this meeting, we were talking about, you know, oh, you know, to do proper CBOR, we had to do some renumbering of our tags and stuff because we really want it to be, you know, uh, layer independent and be able to do, you know, serve a future where we're sending completely different types of things than uh, what we're sending today. And it'll still work. Uh, okay, Wolf, um, should we go, any questions on, Oh, the, sort of back to our requirements. That was kind of like, anybody have any, is it worth our time to, um, uh, I mean, what would be your priorities as far as um, uh, what you would like to see us next to do or to address, you know, the BBQR, um, uh, you know, um, fork? <laughs> Chris, um, I've made this point in a previous meeting. Um, I do think that a single document that specifies uh, this completely is a useful thing. I don't think it's ideal that part of the, uh, and I'm using air quotes here, specification is in the code. I understand why I, I, I get, get that, but if you were to ask one thing that I think would help, uh, I think writing it all out, putting it in a document would help. That's okay. my feed feedback. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to add on that. I think actually think that uh, the Seabor encoding for the UR themselves is overkill because it's such a simple structure and it's almost uh, unfortunate that you have to, at least in theory, have the complete the Seabor decoder to be able to decode just the fragments. Uh, but I think if you do write it out, it's possible, as we talked about the last time with respect to the output descriptive format, I think for URs, it's very possible, uh, it's, it's likely that it's possible to write out the complete representation 
a binary representation without specifying to Seaborg, and just note that it just happens to be happens to be uh, compatible with any Seaborg compliant uh, decoder. And I think that's very valuable to do because one of the things I like about BBQR, I don't like it because URs are widespread, so it's kind of too late. Uh, but as a, as a single, uh, as, a, as an isolated uh, specification, I like it because it doesn't have this very, um, it doesn't have a reference to another binary format just for encoding fragments. I, understand, I can understand why the more detailed formats, such as output descriptors and so on, uh, that you want to be use Seaborg for that, but for just for encoding fragments in, in QR codes, that, that seems like overkill. Okay. Well, I'm going to put a call out to continue this discussion. Shannon, can you take a note to maybe talk about a, uh, I don't know what the right term for it. I keep on calling it mono repo, but I don't think that's the right term, but uh, mono spec, et cetera, just for QR, UR, PBST, um, and or some reference code that you know maybe doesn't you know parse uh, all of uh, you know doesn't use a traditional Seaboard parser uh, as a goal, and see if we can't get some some of you to kind of help us uh, do this again. I am you know it is a, a you know a a budget issue um, you know because of the the crypto winter has not ended for us despite Bitcoin and other currencies coming up. Um, our donations are significantly down, and so we're trying to be very careful. So let's, you know, marshal the community. Um, you know, the more people that are interested, uh, you know, we will up the priority of, of writing this. Um, else, you know, we will help coordinate, uh, you know, us all writing it together and maybe, you know, uh, sharing some resources to do it right. I'm so, back. I apologize for the it, drop. It, my, it my doesn't VPN even have to be. decide to crap out. Okay, it doesn't sorry. even have to be a, um, a, a single specification for my sake. It's I agree with Craig that I just want to see a specification that doesn't refer to reference code. It can be, of course, pseudocode or something, but it does. I'd prefer to not to see a specification that does not refer to, say, a Swift or Rust or whatever. I think we all would. We all would. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's that's one of the thing. I I, I did re-implement all this in Go when we did the seed hammer implementation for it. Uh, so I've been through this, and that was one of the. It does. It, it's not like the the code is that difficult to read. It's just once you go to the level of code, you have to build up an abstract abstraction in your head from that code. Whereas when you read specifications, they are designed for humans to to uh, to transfer the 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 pertinent knowledge and not all the extra stuff that programming languages uh, force you to do. This also my I absolutely. I absolutely agree. This also might be something on your teams if you've got a, a, a junior engineer or somebody you're trying to bring up um, to all of these things uh, to you know give us some percentage of their time to help uh, work on these and test them, et cetera. Um, you know that also is a uh, uh, you know something um, that could help make this come out faster. I was just going to ask, do you guys have an estimate of how much work that is remaining to do that? Or have you spent any time? Um, uh, probably a couple of weeks. I mean, it's it's something where, you know, it's always a matter of juggling priorities. And because, you know, we've already, we're already seeing very good adoption of UR without having done that, there maybe hasn't been enough impetus, although we're, you know, I completely acknowledge that we 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 need a better spec. Uh, and uh, um, so it's, again, it's a matter of, you know, do we have the resources to get that better spec while while people are, in actually adopting UR, you know, and, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think Christopher and I completely agree that, you know, especially if UR is going to advance through some kinds of standard process, which we'd like to see it, uh, including the fountain codes, um, then, uh, you know, it really should be a standalone spec as, uh, as E suggested. Yeah. I mean, right now I feel like, you know, it, it would be half an FTE, uh, or MTFT, MFTE monthly full-time equivalent. Um, so like half a month or so to, to write a better spec of, uh, by a senior engineer. Um, and, uh, you know, if we're also writing a reference library that, you know, kind of competes with, uh, BBQR that only does one thing and does it well and efficiently, that's a bit longer. Um, but, you know, sort of a BIP quality document standalone, um, only about QR, UR, PSBT, 
Um, that Actually, it only has to be about the fountain codes because once you have the fountain codes, then you can refer to that spec uh, in other mm -hmm. higher level specs such as UR. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you only need to get to the payload, the, co the combined payload. Yes. Uh, in my opinion, that's that's covering everything that PPQR is. Uh, is and that's is what I would focus. Cover. That's what I would focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, because I think uh, the PSBT uh, two that we are using right now is isn't it just a uh, uh, a uh, crypto bytes or something? What? No. What? Well, it's 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 a it's a specific PSBT wrapper uh, with the, it's which is Seaboard tag with the actual I mean, binary a single tag, with, 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 so... a with, with, with a binary string inside it, which is the PSBT. Right. But there is no, I mean, you don't have to have a Seabor parser to turn, to turn that, that into byte words. No, it's two bytes at the beginning. You just, yeah, you just exactly. look at them and you say, this is a PSBT and you discard them. And then you just process the rest as a PSBT. Yeah. Well, there, there's a link, there's a, there's a length indicator as well. Yeah. yeah. It's only if you want to do things generically and handle more kinds of things that you need uh, uh, some kind of limited Seabor support. Anyhow, let's, let's move on to Gordian depository. Cause this has been a, something we've been working on for a long time. Um, Can I just ask two questions before you move on? Sure. Uh, the last time we talked about uh, the, the unfortunateness of the previous output discrete performer not being widespread enough. Uh, and one of the suggestions was to, to specify the format as a BIP so that because as someone brought up, BIPs are for better or worse, the reference and specifications for the Bitcoin community. Is that something that you plan to do with the new format? Um, yes, the quite again, the um, uh, I'll, I'll be clear. Um, for instance, this Gordian depository we consider to be very significant because if we can get this rolled out and get parties like Human Rights Foundation, Museum of Modern Art, et cetera, to participate in this, maybe we will get more donations into blockchain commons because we are now offering a legitimate competitor to some of the uh, vendor locked in. Uh, social key recovery uh, things by Ledger, and I'm you know hearing some things from Spiral and Square about this type of uh, you know uh, vendor locked um, uh, social key and sovereign key recovery. So um, uh, you know I have been prioritizing uh, you know Wolf and Shannon in my time and and a couple of other contractors to focus on this. Um, and, uh, uh, because I believe this is going to help us get the kind of patronage that we need. Um, and then hopefully there's enough time people, I want to bring some more people on board in the, in the coming year as, uh, sort of journeyman engineers, uh, journeyman self, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, to, to work on things like BIPs you know, reviewing code, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's sort of a budgetary thing, but yeah, absolutely. We, we want to do, we've wanted to do this as a BIP for a long time. So, um, so, uh, so it's not, it's, you're not suggesting it for widespread implementation before it's for BIP. That's, that's what I want to be clear of. I want to have the, whatever the format ends up with, I want to have, I want to see widespread <clears throat> support for it. Uh, and not end up in the same situation as the last. We don't want to be in a chicken egg situation, though, because we need to know the community actually supports this uh, before proceeding with a BIP, because what we don't want to do is go bother with a BIP and then have the community, community say, who are you? So we want to know that the, the, the community feels like this is, that they're behind this. And, uh, and so uh, we are creating reference implementations and people are, are, you know, are able to try them out and see if they work. I'm not suggesting that people base their entire product strategy around them at this point. But but I think it would be a mistake to just ignore it until it's a bit. Yeah. And again, it's, you know, for us, one of the biggest signals is at least two companies working on it together for interoperability. So, I mean, you know, here in this room, we have, uh, or well, Craig isn't here right now, but he was here earlier. You know, we have Ken and Craig from two major um, Bitcoin wallets. And they basically said, yeah, uh, we want to make this work. We want to make this op interoperable. That raises, you know, um, it's a signal for me to raise the priority of also writing it a bit so that we can get it out to the next three people, um, dozen people, you know, the world. Um, and that's how I try to prioritize um, these types of things is, you know, one of the signals is donations and what, a, you know, they're, you know, what a patron says is our 
our uh, priority. And, and, and um, you know, another signal is, you know, when I look at the donations from, you know, the Bitcoin community to Blockchain Commons, it's $1,000 a month of, of small donations. I'm not, not including the patrons. I mean, we have uh, Ken and others who are, are uh, you know, patrons in the Bitcoin community. Uh, but that's a signal. I mean, it, it, it helps do it. And then uh, that very important signal of priorities is, oh, there are two or more companies that, you know, are are um, saying this is important and we want to implement it and we want to make sure we uh, interoperate. Um, does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So Ken, and so what's the, I, I'm, I'm looking for what's the next step on the output descriptive format. That's basically it. What's the next is it wallet implementer implementers like Ken and Craig? Is it uh, is well, it you I, writing I, BIP? Is it what's the next step here? I think next would be basically that you know uh, developers who are in a position to use this need to you know satisfy themselves that it is what they're looking for, and then they need to at least voice their full throated support for it to the community. You know, make some kind of public declaration, uh, you know, tweets or whatever, or or a co signed letter or something like that, saying that. You know, we support this proposal becoming a BIP. So this is something that once we actually refer to it, then you know, in our BIP proposal, that uh, that people understand there is support for this. And um, uh, and so, um, you know, because you know, there's un undoubtedly people once we start that process that have have no idea who we are, who have never seen our uh, one of our proposals before, and who are going to put up resistance. And so we need they need to understand that this is not coming to at them de novo. That it's actually. Uh, something that is, that the community has already reviewed and is already supporting. Um, anyhow, and, we're and making, and as Christopher mentioned, making donations would be a good idea too, because that actually shows that people are willing to put their money where their mouth is.